Uh, my father was a concrete contractor, so as a little kid I grew up with uh, concrete, so I'm fascinated with the material. And as an architect, I always uh, like to work with concrete. Um, you know, tonight I'll talk about different projects and how it manifested itself. And one part of it is that it's massiveness, it's timelessness that as an architect there are many things that you could do with it. And of course that as a material that you pour it in liquid form and it settles and it changes phases and you know takes a shape. So I find really that very poetic as a as a design, as a design material. Um, you know, so in terms of like Design and scale to me could shift in many different ways. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be a very big project to be an interesting design challenge. So when we looked at the uh, design competition for Casa, uh, we looked up the co company. It's an amazing uh, company that focuses on design. So we thought that we would like to uh, enter this competition. And of, of course, I love the concrete. So that kind of was really the. Um, the driver for us to enter the competition. Well, I think, let me just say one thing about the importance of design competitions in, in, in the architectural world. Historically, they're like real important. And, and I, as when I started my own practice, I made a pledge that we will, as a firm, enter three competitions a year. And our goal would not, like we won't enter it to win, we will enter to explore ideas that we haven't uh, and find competitions that challenges us. So that's one criteria, and of course we look at, you know, who the jury is. We look at, you know, what the challenge is, and it's, if it's interesting enough. I mean, of course, timing from a pragmatic point of view plays in. Like, if we have the right timing, uh, in this case, we, you know, like I said, I love the material. The company is great, and and working on an industrial product, working on a product scale, was appealing for me as an architect because we always design at a much different scale and it takes, I mean, especially my prior work, which were very large scale projects, it takes, you know, sometimes almost a decade to complete, which one, uh, you know, contrary to the tile, you just design it in, in a couple of weeks when we won the competition. Uh, Peter Roscoe, the, the uh, owner of Casa, brought me the tile and it was just uh, fascinating. So I think, you know, a combination of those, and some of it is really random. You just look at it and say intuition, you just say, well, I feel like, doing this competition. So when we started the design of the tile, like I'm beyond fascination of the material itself, so we, we kind of dissected the problem into two. We said, like, how is our approach to repetition and, and, and creating a field of tiles? So one thing that we said is the tile should have uh, an aspect ratio of one to five, like very linear, so it has a grain, it has a direction, so that when you put it horizontal or vertical, by just virtue of its direction, it, it looks different, right? So if you do a square tile, you flip it, it doesn't matter. And, and it doesn't really, you, know, you can see that there, without even any texture on it, you could see that the proportion is really key. The second thing that we looked at is that the texture, the, the, the surface formation should have an asymmetry to it, so that you can actually create, multiply it in different ways. Like I said, what I'm trying to achieve a repetitive field that could generate with a single tile design the most amount of different combinations. So that's the repetition part. The concrete part, and that's why we call it liquid forms, is my personal sort of fascination with concrete. You know, like as I said earlier, that when you pour concrete, it's liquid and it settles and it only takes its final form and it changes phases. But I think that's very poetic like a material that goes from liquid to changing a phase, and it, then it becomes uh, its form, ultimate form. So that we wanted to celebrate that the, the origins of concrete was liquid. So we looked at expressing that, and, and part of it also creating edges where you can actually see the boundary conditions of the curvature. So if you look at the liquid forms, you can trace the edges like as if a wave breaking um, or you know, like the, the, the Baroque sculptures where you can see the edge of the, 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 the dresses. So that sort of form between the curvature and the edges, I think, creates a very important uh, aesthetic contrast. Uh, and that's what I think what makes the liquid forms so exciting uh, to see in light and how it changes with shadows. That's why we love it. I think 
I am fascinated by repetition, and that's another reason why we entered the, the competition was repetition is a, is a very important design tool, and I, I get inspired by the music of uh, Steve Reich, of Philip Glass, I mean that uh, sort of that repetitive character and how it sort of transforms, and it's really to understand what the integer is and, and how it kind of combines and, and propagates. Um, so in that regards, as a designer, I'm very, very fascinated by it. When it comes to tall buildings, repetition is key because there are a lot of things that repeat in a tall building, right? And it's sort of one reason that it exists is it repeats the site. You know, you take a project and you say it's a 50-story building, you get 50 floors. So they may change, they may not, they may be the same or not, right? So that sort of repetition is inherent in uh, tall buildings. Now, however, unlike the tile field, repetition in tall buildings result to something else too. So and I will say this, if repetition for me at some level is a bottom-up approach where you think about the integer and then you think of how it propagates to a larger field, that is true for the tall buildings, but there is one more element where you have to also look at it from top down and say, when they all come together, do they behave? Because a 50-story building is not 51 story buildings on top of each other, they start behaving. So there is much more technical challenges that kind of comes with that. But inherently, I think as a designer though, you have to understand the notion of thinking bottom up and thinking what the integer does and how you can propagate it. So I think it's a very powerful, powerful tool. You know, really, there are qualities of concrete that you, the fact that you can locally manufacture with local uh, uh, components, ingredients, is of course kind of opens up a lot of opportunities. I mean, we explored uh, some of the projects, rammed earth structures that actually uses earth and, and you know, some of the, you know, you bring in the, the, the cementitious elements of concrete, so it's sort of like a mix between, you know, a reinforced concrete building and, and you know, a sort of a structured rammed earth uh, buildings. I, I agree, I mean, there is a lot of potential to using uh, locally sourcing. And, you know, if you actually were to make an analogy. I, I think, let's first look at the tall buildings, you know, as it originated in Chicago and New York in the turn of the century, uh, end of 19th century to, to into 20th century with the advancement of fire safety issues and elevating. Those were like the two inventions. Uh, so they. In some ways, they are the same, right? They create, what did they do to those these two cities? They create a density. And with that density, the metro worked and, and the metropolis emerged. The modern sort of 20th century New York emerged from that sort of densification and maybe Van Kohlhaas's sort of culture of congestion argument goes to that. But then, tall buildings, not all of them, some play a different function, like Empire State Building, right? You know, at the turn of, uh, the depression where not everything stopped in America, where this uh, 80 plus story building, it's a 1400, almost 1430 feet or so, building stood proud of uh, what, what is possible. So like that kind of optimism, let's say if you want to call it an urban spectacle, part of it also plays with that. And, and I think you can't really take it out of it. Now, the danger with that though, is if you start thinking buildings as objects, as sculptural forms, then you sort of step into a very superficial uh, ground. So to come back to today, are they necessary? When there is a need for urban density, they are great building typologies, but you can never take a city and plug in one tower. You have to look at it in a much more holistic way from a master planning, from a city planning point of view. And then there may be opportunities where one or some of those buildings have a certain prominence to create, just like the bell towers did, to create a silhouette in a city. So Alhambra did, I would say, argue both, right? In an interesting time in Kuwait history, where you know it created a pride for the Kuwaitis, but also it was part of a larger master plan of a certain densification in the peninsula. So it had an urban function, so it wasn't thought to be an object it was thought to be a, a tower, a building. Um, are they the only tool? No, I mean, you know, I wouldn't say 
to be a city, a progressive city, you don't have to start building 80-story towers, 100-story towers. I don't think so. That, again, that would be a very superficial way to look at it. Every city has its own culture and background. I, I wouldn't be shy of looking at them, but I don't think they are, or they are the only sort of form of, uh, let's say, architectural or engineering accomplishments. First of all, Budapest is a beautiful city. It has, it's blessed with its topography, and you know, like it's very unique. And there aren't that many cities that have that sort of. You know, there are cities that a river goes through, but Budapest is, is unique, very unique. So I think that one needs to be very careful about approaching this and just like sticking towers, whether on the Pest side or the Buddha side, randomly. I don't think that is a total approach. Whether you need the towers or not, it's a whole other discussion. I think, to me the approach will be to sort of look at it holistically. Whether Budapest requires a level of density in an area where is appropriate, right? I mean, Paris did that, and they didn't build the towers in, in the middle of the old city, and they, they moved on to a whole other area. And we can debate whether that's successful or not, but I think it requires a certain level of larger planning thought. At that level, I wouldn't rule it out. I think you should look into it. I'm not saying you should do it, but you could study it, you could study what it does to the silhouette or the modern silhouette of Budapest. But one needs to be careful not to overwhelm and, and, and really take away what's so beautiful about Budapest here is. I think a city that is nostalgic of its past is the worst thing you could do to your history, right? If you nostalgia, I hate nostalgia. Like once you kind of start thinking your history from a nostalgic point of view, it's really you know you, you start in a very, very bad place. So change is in the life, whether we like it or not. So I am not, I think that there may be a place um, and and a scale for tall buildings in Budapest. I think that needs to be embraced and studied, and and what scale and where is a whole you know a much more complex thing. Um, is it the only way of being a city doing the change and being progressive? Not, you know, not necessarily. Uh, but let me say also one characteristic, important characteristic of our tall buildings is that they're actually a very sustainable way to create density, right? So if you compare Los Angeles where the sprawl goes forever and you could say, oh, look at these nice two-story buildings. Well, but they create a huge carbon footprint. Like you get, you, you can't create public transportation. You get highways, you know, and you actually end up touching too much land, right? So whereas New York, you could say, well, look, it's a built-up city, it's a concrete jungle, but it actually, with that, it brings density. Density makes it actually per person much more uh, sustainable, right? Instead of taking highways, you take an elevator, right? So. That's a valid argument. And the other valid argument is that kind of level of density creates what Ram said about the cultural congestion, you know. Sort of that certain level of congestion is good because that, that's what it started the cities in the first place. You know, the culture of exchange, you need that density to make the opera house work, to make certain. And in today's world, I would say, I wouldn't be afraid of it. I mean, I've looked at many parts of the world master planned it, I mean obviously built places in China, in Shenzhen, in Alhambra, in Kuwait, um, and others, but I as a designer and as an urban planner, I look at the, like to look at the problem more comprehensively and don't fall into the object quality of the tower as a, as a form of sort of monumentalizing either capitalism or progressiveness or whatever you, however way you want to take it. But I think it's, uh, it's much more about good urban design. And, and there is a place for that. And there's a place for that, you could say, in any city. So it's really, uh, it's I think the Budapest planners, community boards, and you know, the entire architectural uh, group here needs to sort of get their arms around, and I'm sure they are. Um, there may be a, there may be an answer. I don't know. <laughs>